Welcome back to Glebe Cottage. It's a real chill in the air. Autumn's beginning to bite. <laughs> I've even put an extra layer on. And the dog's sitting on the knee just to keep me warm. <laughs> but we've got such a lot to get on with. One of the things we want to do is see collecting. But can you see? Fifi's already started. Her nose is completely covered in seeds. <laughs> With Fifi beside me, I've watched my garden shift from season to season. Each change in the calendar is announced by plants that have waited for their moment to shine. Like this one, it's a member of the daisy family and a really important autumn resident in the garden. All summer long, it's this quiet green presence, you don't notice it. Its stems come up, they branch out and then, Almost like a, a clarion call to autumn. These flowers open and they last for weeks and weeks, probably right the way through to the end of November. This is Rebecca fulgidademii. They say that yellow is the colour of spirituality. Well, if that's true, this is certainly the most spiritual of plants. Butterflies, bees, all sorts of hoverflies descend on these to feed on the pollen and nectar. And then later on, when the petals actually drop to the floor, these seed heads provide food right the way through the winter. I never ever chop them down, always leave them, because they're just so beautiful too. For gardeners and for wildlife, this is a brilliant plant. These yellow daisies will continue to glow even as the light of autumn is fading. But for many other plants, their transient burst of fiery colour at this time of year signals the end. I love this, this moment when you start raking the first leaves up. And as you're walking along the path, whether you're on the city street or out in the garden on a dry autumn day like this, that lovely crunch, there's nothing like it. And it just tells you, yeah, it's autumn. That's what's going to happen from now on. The tree's grown, it's had more and more leaves, and now it's autumn and they're falling down. That's what they call autumn in the United States, isn't it? It's fall. It's that time of year when all these leaves are descending. But for now, it's all about what to do with these fallen leaves. For me, there's no contest, and I've just the job in mind. Making your own leaf mould is as easy as falling off a log. I'm the king of the cattle, or at least I'm the queen of the leaf mould heap. Look at this, isn't it gorgeous? Leaf mould is simply decomposed autumn leaves which have been broken down by fungi. Leaf mould is a hugely important part of the whole process in the garden. It doesn't give your garden lots of nutrition in the same way that compost does, but what it does is really improve the texture of your soil. It's absolutely luscious stuff, and it's totally free and really, really easy. All it is is piles of leaves, one on top of the other, so over the next few weeks, I'll clear all the leaves that have fallen from the paths, from the beds, everything. And I'll bring them all down here. And then I'll build a brand new leaf mould heap. <laughs> a lot of people say, well, you know, if all those leaves are falling off the trees, why don't you just leave them where they are? But the point is that if you were just in a wood, you'd, you'd do that, you'd let it get on with it. But this is a garden and there are all sorts of precious plants there. Everything's close together. And if I just leave those leaves to fall and build up gradually over the years, in their process of rotting down and changing themselves into leaf mould, they drown quite a few of the precious little plants. I mean, you don't need a great big garden and loads of trees like me to be able to make leaf mould. Any leaves that you can gather together, even in a small space, you can bung them into a, a black plastic bag. They'll take a bit longer to break down make a few holes in it, um, just to make sure it doesn't sit there and get really soggy. But my mum always used to do that. And she used to cadge leaves from her neighbours too. 
going down the street with a barrow. I suppose lots of people think of Leeds as being a nuisance, you know, they block up the gutters and the drains, but they're a precious, precious resource. I've even known people actually burn them. What a terrible waste when they can turn them all into this delicious stuff. Don't worry, I'm not going to eat it, but my garden's going to absolutely love it. This beautiful pile of black stuff has been brewing for about a year, and later on, I'll be lavishing it on a new bed. Next, the vital ingredient for getting the garden ready for next year. Just a little teeny drop on here. Ooh. At least it's extra virgin. And the timely capture of some fabulous foxgloves. Oh yeah, you can actually hear them. Nice rattle. This time of year in Britain, wherever you live, one sight greets all of us when the leaves of deciduous trees take centre stage. How about this for a smorgasbord of autumn delights? This array of leaves just from the garden and a couple of the hedgerows around. And these are just a few examples of the kind of colours that you get during this wonderful season. But where does autumn colour come from? Why do leaves change like that? Well, if you look at this, this is Viburnum opulus, the Gelder rose. And this is its typical guise from most of the growing season. It's green. And that green comes from chlorophyll, which is within the leaf, and helps the plant utilise sunshine, its energy. But what happens when it becomes a different colour. Same plant, but a totally different colour. You can see here the remnants of that green. Well, that's because all that chlorophyll is gradually absorbed by the plant. It's taken back down into it because it's a vital resource, really, and it doesn't want to waste it. It will be used again during the next growing season. So where do all these other beautiful colours come from? Well, actually, they're always there within the leaf, but hidden by the green, which is much, much stronger kind of pigmentation. So when that green withdraws, it leaves behind it all these beautiful, beautiful colours. What a glorious sight. In the garden, some of my plants are now at the peak of their autumn show. Clambering along this entire oak fence from one end to the other, and not content with that, clambering right up into the trees above is this magnificent climber. It's Vitis cognitii, it's a kind of vine. I absolutely love it, I love these big leaves. But the real reason that people include it in the gardens is because of what it does in the autumn. Just look at this array of different colours, almost kaleidoscopic. Well, I'm lucky enough to have enough space to give this magnificent climber its head and let it do what he wants. But if space is limited, there are all sorts of other options. Ground dwellers that have equally beautiful colours on their foliage at this time of year. Let me introduce you to this beautiful plant. This is Gilania trifoliata, so called because it's got three leaves all the way down its stems. Gilania is a member of the rose family and it's got lots of close cousins which adopt equally beautiful hues during the autumn. Things like Aruncus dioicus, a great big goat's beard, big majestic plant. And many of the geraniums, the crane's bills, turn to beautiful colours during the autumn. Geranium lassarianum, which I've got growing on a bank at the top, is absolutely fiery at the moment. It's orange and yellow and almost sort of charred around the edge. It's just gorgeous and such an easy plant to grow. I think one of the things that I absolutely love about gardening is the way that everything changes all the time. Nothing is ever static. 
So from week to week, from month to month, and particularly from season to season, the garden just changes. It's almost like a, a totally different place. That's what makes it so very exciting. I mean, way back in the summer, this was resplendent with bronicostrum covered in tiny purple flowers and loads of attendant insects, butterflies and hoverflies and bees galore. But it's just as beautiful now. Over the years, my gardens taught me so much about what to plant and how to get a succession of interest throughout the seasons. But how do you decide what to keep and what to cut back? Look at this glorious as still be. It's in seed now, but back in the summer, it was full of frothy white flowers. I love these seed heads, but I'm also enamored of these gorgeous leaves, aren't they beautiful? I mean, some people would just go and chop those down, but I'm going to let them gradually die back because I just love that. Sometimes there's great beauty in death. But there are some things I'm going to take the secateurs to. No time like the present. And after a nip to the kitchen for lubrication, at least it's extra virgin. Just a little teeny drop on here. Ooh. They sound just right. I'm going to give this Astrantia a haircut now. This is Astrantia Major. It's got lots of lovely country names. Hattie's Pink Cushion. Back in the summer, it was a glorious pinky white froth. Each of the flowers looked like a pink cushion. It's rather unsightly, and I think everybody in corners of the garden have plants that are looking a bit like this. Slightly jaded, in fact, definitely on the way out. Most of that goodness has been taken down from these leaves into the roots of the plant. So I'm just going to give it a, a total haircut. I'm just going to drag all this out of here. And when you cut, don't leave stubby little stems because those will gradually rot and die down. No point now, they've finished with those leaves, so cut them back right to the base of a plant. That crown now is exposed to the sun and the air and next spring, when those new leaves come up, they'll have no competition from any of this debris lying around them. Now, there are a few things that don't need any tools at all. This is a daylily, a hemerocalis or hemerocalis. It's utterly gorgeous. But now it's turned into these staghorns. And with a bit of luck, I can pull the whole thing out. So right to the base of a stem like that. And that means there are no stubby bits left if I haven't cut down properly. As easy as can be. Just like that. But not all plants are ready to lose their heads. I think that's just beautiful. There are some plants that look just as good when they're on the way out as they do when they're at the height of their flower power. And I think this is one of them. This is a, an eryngium, a sea holly. It's called Borgatii, and it does the most splendid thing. When it comes up into flower, it's silver. And then, gradually, all the stems go blue and these flower heads go blue too. And that's a sure sign that the pollen and the nectar within these lovely sort of conical collections of flowers is ready. And that's when the bees move in. They absolutely adore the plant. Although it's called the sea holly, it's actually from the, the Alps, the Pyrenees. It's a mountain plant, but you can grow it in any ordinary garden. It needs to be reasonably well drained. That's why it does so brilliantly up here on the raised bed. But in sunshine, that's its primary requisite. But now it's on the way out. It's going brown gradually. 
but I just love that change. It's just so poetic, really. I want to make sure my garden continues its wonderful cycle next year, which means for some plants, time is of the essence. Just look at these seed heads, glinting in the sun, just waiting to be collected. I mean, this time of year is the prime time for collecting seed. It's harvest time. This is a, a glorious foxglove. It's called parviflora, which just means small flowered. This is perennial. In other words, it'll come up year after year. It's quite short lived, so it's always great to have a stock of new plants to put in. And the only way to do it really is to collect their seed. Grab it tightly around the base there. I'll lose a few of the seeds at the bottom, but that doesn't matter. Oh yeah, they are dry enough. I was a bit worried. I thought they might be a bit damp, but you can actually hear them. Nice rattle. And when you think about it, to have bought all these plants, I would have paid a fiver each if I bought them as growing plants. So it um, saves you money too. But the great joy is actually sowing the seeds, seeing it germinate, growing it on, and then putting it back in your garden. Look at this lot, aren't they beautiful? I love this orange with that sort of jade green. It's beautiful, pure autumn. Yeah, but this is what I'm in here for. I'm really pleased to be undercover actually because it's pouring down with rain again. Instead of tipping it right onto my hand, I'll just try and pour a bit of the seed out here, let's see what we've got. Ooh, yeah. Loads and loads. Well, I'm not going to pour it all out because I'm not going to sow it all. And the rest can stay in that paper bag and I can sow more later if I want to. Look what tiny, fine seed it is. It really is. And the finer your seed is, the more important it is not to sow it too thickly. I've got a couple of half seed trays here that are filled with good seed compost. Lots of grit in it too, so drainage isn't going to be a problem. Pinch of seed, about a couple of inches just above the level of the, whatever you're sowing into, your tray or your pot. Really doesn't matter at all. What's most important is that you surface sow and you don't try and put too many in there. And then I want, some grit, of course. <laughs> and I'm just going to sprinkle that very evenly across this surface. Now, it almost looks as though I'm burying this under this grit. But if you imagine, grit lets lots of light through and water too. So it's very, it's very similar to the sort of conditions that if that foxglove seed fell naturally onto the ground, you know, that's just what it would meet at ground level. In nature, some of it will survive, um, but some of it won't. I hope all my resultant seedlings from this will survive. These are some I did earlier, but it's a different foxglove. The little seedlings of Digitalis purpurea alba. So in other words, it's our native foxglove, the purple foxglove that you see in all the hedgerows. But this is a, a white form of it. And you can always tell white foxglove seeds. You look into the plant, there's no trace of purple on these stems. So I think all those are going to be white. So what I'll do with these eventually is pop those on and I'll end up with something like this. And at this stage, I'm going to take them out and plant them in the garden. The big difference between this and the one I've just sown is that Parviflora is a perennial, so it's going to come up every year. Whereas our native foxglove, Digitalis purpurea, is a biennial. In other words, in its first year, it'll make a great big rosette of leaves. 
In its second year, it'll produce those gorgeous spikes of flower that the bumblebees love. But then, once it's set seed, it'll die. So you really need to establish a routine if you want foxgloves in your garden every year. You need to sow them every year too. So they're constantly taking over from one another. And that way you'll guarantee that you've got those gorgeous tall spires. If you want to enjoy biennial foxgloves year after year, collect the seed in autumn, then sow thinly onto a tray of compost, followed by grit. Once the seedlings are big enough to handle, plant them out to grow on in the garden and repeat the following year to ensure flowers every summer. Despite all this pouring rain, which has really pushed stuff down, those grasses are just standing up for themselves. Look how they've changed. Every time I walk past here, there's something different to see. It's the same view, but all the plants have changed in this millennia. Instead of getting squashed by this torrential rain, these beautiful arching stems, which were green and purple and brown, are now golden and absolutely glowing in this bit of sunshine. Utterly beautiful. Next, an autumn sight with a colour that never fades. But right now, the best thing to enjoy about it is the perfume. My passion for cultivating my garden gets bigger and bigger. And seeing how plants grow in the wild never ceases to fascinate me. There's one group of plants that looks good and has interest every day of the year. It's ivy. Look at these wonderful flowers, these gorgeous glossy leaves. This ivy's growing up this little barn. It's made itself completely at home. Look how it climbs. These stems are almost indistinguishable from the wood it's actually climbing up. Ivy attaches itself to whatever is its host with adventitious roots little roots on the back of the stems that help it go up high. And it's not until it reaches this kind of height that you see these beautiful starbursts, these green explosions that absolutely smother the upper stems. They're a total delight. No petals, but stamens, which decorate these lovely heads. Of course, these flowers aren't just for decoration. They'll be followed by beautiful berries. So. This is a hugely attractive plant to all sorts of insects. They'll home in on this nectar and pollen within these flowers. Eventually, when they've been pollinated, they'll turn to lovely blue and black berries. This wonderful sort of larder for birds right the way through the winter. Ivy must be the most opportunistic of plants. It'll climb up anything, anywhere, anytime. Look here even climbing up this telegraph pole. These colonising climbers never stop. They not only support wildlife, but when winter bites, they stand up to the elements. I definitely want to plant more of them. In my garden, ivies aren't the only evergreens I've come to admire. It's gorgeous, isn't it? But before I put this ivy in place, I want to tell you about this lovely shrub here. It's called Trochlodendron. I think it's Araleoides. It's a very, very beautiful evergreen and it looks wonderful all the year round. There aren't many evergreens in the garden here. A few evergreen shrubs and a, an odd conifer or two, but they play a vital role, especially in the winter when there's not a lot else to look at. They really come into their own then. So why don't evergreens lose their leaves? It's got a lot to do with protecting themselves. If you could look into the, the cells of these leaves, they're very, very close together, so they don't allow very much water in between them. That means they, they retain the water they have got, but in the event of it freezing, 
the whole leaf doesn't freeze at all, it's protected and then there's a second protection too. All evergreen leaves are hard and shiny. Think of a holly, think of an ivy. Those leaves, when you get hold of them, are really substantial and they have this waxy coating very often and that's a further way to make sure that they can retain their leaves all year round which is great in the middle of the winter when I'm looking out of the front windows. I've always got something to look at. Even if your plot is small, you can bring evergreens into the garden. I've chosen this ivy, which will even thrive in a container, as I'll show you once Fifi and Sylvie have made way for this delightful plant. Well, this is a totally different species from the one we saw on the barn. That is our own native ivy, Hedera helix, but this is a form of Hedera colchica, sometimes called a Persian ivy because that's where it comes from originally. But this is bred specifically for people with small gardens or limited space. And it's ideal for planting in a great big plastic pot and then dropping down into something ornamental, as well as being shrubby in nature and quite short of stature. It grows widthways too, and then it comes out in these splendid flowers. And you see butterflies, the autumn hatch of butterflies, because a lot of butterflies actually come out at this time of year too. So this is an ideal plant for them to feed on. Pollen and nectar are plenty in all these flowers. Any plant in a pot, you've got to check on the watering from time to time, but it doesn't need any additional feed. You can prune it back after those flowers and the berries have finished and everybody's had their feast. Give it a, a quick trim here and there, just cutting back to a leaf node and that will mean that it'll expand and get better and better every year. More and more flowers and more and more berries for everybody to enjoy. But right now, the best thing to enjoy about it is the perfume. Oh, it's delicious. I could drink in this scent all day long, but there's a corner of my garden that needs attention. It's ideal for another new ivy, and there's something for it to climb up too. Look at that. What a beautiful ivy, isn't it handsome? This is Hedera helix sagittifolia. And so just like Sagittarius, the archer, it means that its leaves are sort of arrow shaped there's a lot of nonsense talked about ivy, about it being a, a nuisance and terrible and really bad for your house. You know, people get worried it's going to rip the walls apart. On the contrary, it actually protects walls. It's only when you start ripping it off that the mortar starts to come out. So out of these four pots, this is the one that's in the densest shade. So this is where I'm going to plant it. And it's already got something to start its climb. One of the great things about ivy is it'll grow just about anywhere. It's hugely accommodating and it thrives in shady places. So if you've got that sort of dark corner, ivy is your ideal solution. And what a benefit it is. There are so many different forms too, but I want to put this Sagittifolia into here. You can almost hear this corner saying, yeah, this is exactly what we need. Here we go. Now I've loosened it a bit in its pot. And it's got a lovely root system. Just break these up a tiny bit at the base. Just a little bit, just to get it going. So it'll put its roots down deep into this pot. That's just right. It's going to be level with the compost when I top it up here and with the top of the pot. I think that's probably enough. If you were to plant this in the ground, exactly the same principle. Make a nice big hole though, first of all, so that those roots will be able to move out everywhere. And make sure it's in firmly. When you're planting anything, it's a really good idea to firm stuff down. So you make sure there's no air pockets in between the roots and the, the soil, or the compost in this case. Ivy couldn't be easier to grow. In a shady spot, dig a deep, wide hole. 
loosen the roots, then top up with compost. Firm it in and finally water well. Evergreens give a garden permanent colour and structure. But even if you don't have a garden, you can still achieve a similar effect. Oh, look at that, what a beautiful pot. <laughs> now, you know what this is, it's a strawberry pot. But I'm not going to plant strawberries in it. <laughs> this time of year, when the days are getting shorter, it's just lovely to come inside and to create something or plant something which is going to go right through the winter, right through next summer and last for ages and ages. So rather than planting strawberries in here, this is going to become the permanent home of some of these beautiful little succulents. They've become much, much more popular during the last few years. And one of the reasons is you don't need a garden to grow these things. You can grow them on your window ledge inside. They need frost protection anyway. I'll have to keep them indoors over the winter. Next summer I can put the whole pot out, provided I can carry it. <laughs> First thing I want to do is add some extra grit to this compost. The thing about succulents is they don't need very much nutrition at all. They've got just about everything within them and within their leaves, which act as little reservoirs to ensure that they'll keep on growing. So I need quite a lot. It holds a lot more than you think it's going to, this, but there are eight holes in here. So that means I can have eight entirely different succulents. I suppose when the compost starts falling out of the holes, you know you've got to the right level. Here we go. I'm going to select ones that I think are going to stay in quite tight rosettes. You can see there, little skinny, skinny roots. These succulents really don't have much of a root system at all, and they often come from really arid areas. I'm going to put that one in there and push it so it's just level with that hole and hope that when I put more compost in, it's not going to fall out the top. They, they're almost made to measure these. <laughs> I'm adding pieces of crock to secure the plants in place. And this also helps the drainage. I'll water them from time to time during the winter, but I think um, what the experts say is, let them get completely dry first of all, but before they start to shrivel, then water, water thoroughly, let the water drain through and then leave them alone. For our grand finale, I think we should have this. How about that for a succulent and a half? Isn't it handsome? It has to be the, the king of succulents. It's called Echeveria bittersweet. Ooh and then finish the whole thing off with grit. In this case, I'm using a really quite thick layer of grit, and the major purpose of that is to stop this rotting because the water is going to go straight through that top layer of grit and then into the compost, rather than sitting around the crown of the plant. It's really nice to see it from all sides, isn't it? I ought to put it on one of those turntables, you know, a lazy Susan so everything gets a chance to be seen in its full glory. But this is the one that's definitely got pride of place. Ta-da! Crowning glory. <laughs> if you want to enjoy succulents all year round, fill a terracotta pot or container with gritty compost. Make sure your succulents are planted firmly. Then top up with more compost and Yes, you guessed it, grit. Next, I'm lighting up a shady corner. Aren't these exquisite, these flowers? And an offering for an old feathered friend. There's something for everyone in the garden. It's time. 
Look at this sweet corn. They're really feeling fat and full. I think they're just ready for harvesting. Well, a few weeks ago, because I've been watching these intently, one of them had got chewed right at the end of the row, and it was obvious it was the deer who'd done it. So I found a crisp packet, it's an empty one, with a very strong chilli flavour, and put it right over that cob. And do you know what? It's worked. Nothing's gone since then, everything's intact, and they've just ripened in the last of this autumn sunshine. All you do... When these tassels turn dark like this, it's a sure sign that the corn inside is ready and ripe. One there. So that one's for me. Let's have a look at this. So, one for Neil, one for me, and one for the dog. And look at that. Small, but sweet and perfectly formed. <laughs> Here we go. I'll leave Neil to remove the juicy kernels for Fifi. Dogs aren't supposed to eat the cobs. But one visitor to my garden is less discerning when it comes to what's on the menu. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> I've decided to make a, a peace offering, a gesture of goodwill to a friend of mine. We've got a sort of love-hate relationship. This is Leicesteria formosana, and it's better known as pheasant berry. Now, this pheasant frequents our garden and pecks at things sometimes, and sometimes I have to chase him. Go! On! Go! On! Go! On! <laughs> it's gone, but it didn't squawk but it's quite nice to see them around. But pheasants absolutely adore them. So I'm afraid people used to plant it so they could shoot the pheasants. Well, I'm not going to shoot him. <laughs> Definitely not. But I do think it would be really nice to reintroduce this. Once it's settled in, it'll absolutely love it. There's something for everyone in the garden. Let's hope my troublesome friend approves. Now it's time for something for me that will light up a once very green corner. Some planting to do, or some just the time for planting. But look at these. This is Matuchius truthioptris. <laughs> it's the shuttlecock fern. Earlier in the year, there were these great big green shuttlecocks all sort of turned in at the end, perfectly symmetrical. I mean, this is a true autumnal picture now, isn't it? So all those fronds that were once green have collapsed around the edge. Again, quite symmetrically. And then up through the centre comes another shuttlecock. And although it's attractive now, I really want to plant a few things here that are going to celebrate the autumn. Aren't these exquisite, these flowers? This has to be my favourite Japanese anemone. It's called Honorine Jobert. I took some root cuttings from these already, but I really want a bit of instant gratification and just put a couple of these under the tree. It doesn't need a great depth of soil, but I must make sure that the hole is deep enough to accommodate that root ball in here. So, I think this is a down on your knees job now. Lots of people use white flowers to sort of separate blocks of colour, but and often in full sun. I don't like that. I don't think you can see it at all. It just sort of burns a hole in the whole picture. But white in shade is something else. It's something entirely different. Look at all that lovely fibrous root. And once this goes in here, those roots will start questing underneath the surface of the soil. Which way round, do you think? Facing that way, yeah. It'll always be looking out at you on your autumnal walk. <laughs> It's 
So alongside these anemones, I want to introduce a few other plants too. And this is one of them. Now, this persicaria, isn't it lovely, and plexicol, does so brilliantly well here, and it's a very similar position. And look what it does. It looked out at you like that. So on this side, this one will look out at you as well, just like the anemones. What do you think of that one there, Fief? Yes, she approves. <laughs> If she finds her mouse hole in there, she might dig the hole for me, make life easier. How about here? No, she's not interested. <laughs> Fifi clearly has better things to do. Maybe she's collecting seed? Meanwhile, I'm going to finish this border with a good helping of the black stuff. Look at this lovely, gorgeous stuff, crumbly and black and beautiful. So this is my leaf mould, which will improve the texture of the soil and make it easier for those roots to move out. Something very poetic about putting this leaf mould in here. I mean, it completes the circle. The leaves came from the garden, they went down to the leaf mould heap, and now it's made, it's beautiful, and they're going back onto the garden. Don't need any chemicals, any additives, anything. It's all here within the garden. That, for me, is a gardening cycle at its brilliant best. And I've loved sharing this place with you. People sometimes ask, what's your favourite season? Well, right now, in the midst of all this, it's autumn, of course. It's been so beautiful. We've had oceans of flowers wafting and waving and these grasses joining in with their glorious golden stones had anemones galore lighting up the dark reaches of the woodland. It's just been superb. I do hope you'll join me again here at Glebe Cottage. In the meantime, enjoy your gardening. But for now, bye-bye. And next time with Carol, she's showcasing Great British Gardens next Thursday at 7. Brand new tomorrow night at 7, we're in for a bit of luxury inside one of the world's most expensive hotels, the George Sank in Paris. Ooh la la. Next and new tonight through Yorkshire to Northumbria and on to the Athens of the North on board the Tornado in world's most scenic railway journeys.